see you every day. Welcome to Bookshopia. Thank you for having me. I'm great to be here. Now this is the fourth book in what was going to be a trilogy, but now it is a longer series, a very, very successful Crossfire series. Um, when you set out to write Bed to You, did you have any of this larger story that was coming in in the back of your mind, or did it come out organically as you wrote? I expected actually the Crossfire series to be two novels. So I figured the first novel would be like Ava's half of the story, the second novel would be Gideon's half of the story, and then it would be finished. Because typically when I write a series, if I do write a romance series, we're usually following several couples. Each couple gets an individual novel. So writing two books about one couple was outside the norm for me. Uh, but I figured that's what it was going to take to tell the story. And then uh, about halfway through the second novel, Reflected in You, I knew it was not going to be finished in two books. Uh, the publisher had acquired three novels, and I didn't think it was going to be finished in three. I thought maybe it would be finished in four, where we'd have two about Ava and two about Gideon, and then it turned out to be two and a half books each, which led to five. Uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't planned. But that's unusual because I have some series, like I've written trilogies that I knew from the outset that was going to be three novels. And then I have some series, like uh, I have a marked series, which is Urban Fantasy, and I figured that would be 12 or more, and I didn't know how, how much more, but that I knew was more of an open-ended thing. So uh, typically I have some idea of where I'm going when I start, and you know, the Crossfire series was different. That, that leads me on to the next question, because... Um, Silby Day is an overnight success, but how long was that overnight? Because when people see the success you have with Bed to You, um, it's, a, it's a kind of success, it's a it's success in capitals, rather than success, it's your successful writer. And then suddenly you had this mega success that, that came at a, at a, you know, in a moment which was, was glorious, absolutely glorious. How long were you writing and how long was your successful overnight success story? Right. I know. I, I tell people that I'm the 10-year overnight <laughs> success, right? I, because I began writing in 2003, um, sold my first book in 2004, was first published in 2005, and of course, Bear to You came in 2012. Uh, and prior to that, of course, if you're continuing to publish for that length of time, you're successful. Yeah. Your publisher will not stay with you, uh, you know, for, for almost a decade if you're not selling, you know, a decent number of books. But then, of course, you know the the Crossfire series is is a completely, completely different animal. You know, with the where over 16 million copies sold that of the Crossfire amazing. series globally. Yeah, number one in 27 countries, uh, 41 different languages. I mean, that that's the sort of thing that you can't uh, you can't expect as a writer, especially somebody who's writing romance. You know, I had very realistic expectations about what sort of success you can find writing romance novels, mm -hmm. uh, and that's. You know, I, I reached that point and was very happy there and, you know, it felt, you know, a sense of accomplishment and pride to, to be that far. And then Bear to You came along and it became something, something else. And, you know, it's exciting and, and yet there's no way to plan for it. I mean, people ask me all the time, you know, did you ever expect to be this successful? And it's like, no, <laughs> no, not at all. Because when, when, when I was down the romance convention down in, in Canada, you were, you were guest star, it was uh, a wonderful weekend, and the relationship between reader and, and writer within the romance community is, is very close, like it's a, it's a strange, for a lot of writers who, who sort of don't get to talk to their, um, their audience, um, romance readers and writers have a relationship because you go into conventions, you, you're, you're able to be seen, they come to the signings uh, in great numbers. Um, how much influence is there upon the writer in the reader's needs? Uh, well, I mean, there's, there's a, a fine line between, of course, giving your readers what they want and writing the story that you're meant to tell. Yeah. So, I mean, on one hand, there's a, you know, a lot of articles that are written about romance and some of those are like, well, they're so full of cliches. And then I'll point out, well, that's not a cliche, it's a trope. That is something that's particular to the to the romance genre, just the way you know the detective is to uh, you know one of those mystery noir novels. You yeah. have to have one. There are certain things you have to have in a romance novel, and you know those are those are just part of of what readers expect to get. 
and you provide those things for them so that you know they get that reading experience they're looking for when they pick up something that's marketed as a romance novel. But on the other hand, you have to write your own story. And while you get feedback from readers, and of course, as you said, romance authors and romance readers spend a lot of time together, uh, way more so than, than other genres where they may have one convention a year, and it's of a very different scope. It, it's less intimate and personal than a, than a romance convention is with readers. You can't let you know romance readers dictate the course of your novel or your books because then it's not your story. It doesn't have the right emotional impact. They're not going to get what they want out of it, which is that punch, which comes from you writing the story that you need to tell. So I was reading on your um, blog, it's, uh, uh, apparently it's a quite old, I think it was 2005 you put this down, it was sort of the descriptions of what an erotic, what a porn was, what erotic fiction was, what uh, erotic romance, and, and you went down and sort of explained each thing and what, what sort of levels you could go to and what the reader would expect out of them. Um, have reading that, I found mine were not erotic romance as the publisher put mine out as, and put them, mine should have been just erotic fiction um, because mine didn't end well. And, and <laughs> ending well is kind of a thing that you need to do if you're a romance writer. Um, how, when you've got a story as complex as yours, was um, Eva and Gideon are, are troubled people yes. underneath. Um, how do you manufacture, well, not manufacture, what's this word? Ensure a happy ending with those two characters. And I, I don't know whether you've suffered the same thing, but sometimes characters get out of hand. You know, they, they come alive and, and you've created them and they sort of turn around and go, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I've got another obje objective and I'm going that way. Um, how do you make them have a, or how do you, how do you ensure that they have a happy ending to, to, to move towards? That's a really good question, and you're right. Um, for me, I always say they're more of a narrator than a creator. Mm -hmm. The characters tell me their story. I just try to type fast enough to keep up. Yeah, so, you know, they, they go their own way and I just kind of follow along. So how do I know they're going to get to the happily ever after? Uh, at this point, it's just I'm so used to them getting there that I can't imagine them not getting there. But there's warning signs in advance. Um, there's one book that I wrote. It's been published as Pride and Pleasure. And when I wrote that book, I was a year with that manuscript and I got to the halfway point and I could tell at that halfway point that these two were never going to end up together. They, there was no way and I'm well one that's not going to work I mean it's a historical romance these two people need to end up together at the end and I was panicked and I called the editor and I'm like I don't know what to do I've been stuck at the midway point of this novel for close to a year we've moved the deadline back multiple times we've moved the publication date back these two people are never going to end up together. And she's like, uh, you need to figure it out. And, it, and yeah, and it's, it's yeah, <laughs> you need to figure it out. She's like, there, there's no, you're the writer, fix it. Well, it doesn't work that way for me. If the characters aren't going to get there, they're not going to get there. So in that case, I had to stop and totally re-examine the whole book and realize, well, I put the hero with the wrong heroine. These two people came to me, I thought they were meant to be together, tried to write them a story, and it wasn't going to happen. So I had to throw it all out. Yeah. A year's worth of work, half of a novel, I had to just delete the whole thing and start all over, put him with a different heroine, and that one, it was clear that they were going to end up together. That's the only time that's happened to me, though. That's the only time where I, I've, I've gotten to the point where it's like, the, I, if I continue to write this book, this is not a romance. <laughs> These people would not end up together. So, I mean, I guess they introduce themselves in a way uh, to where they're kind of like, this is the one I want to be with, and there you go. What are some of the, 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 the lines that they can't cross? I mean, Gideon, um, you know, he, 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 in, in the bad to you, he, he does some, he behaves pretty badly um, at, in certain times. How bad can someone behave before it's, a wall comes down, there's, there's no return from this? Like, what are, what are some of the signs that would say to you as a writer, he can't do this? Ah, you know, I haven't really stumbled across too many of those. I mean, I've had the ones where they've had to grovel um, pretty badly to, to get, you know, to, to the point where they're forgiven. Um, I, I've, never, I've never had a really unheroic hero. I do have very flawed heroes, and the heroines too. I mean, I always say that I write more flawed heroines than I do heroes. Uh, he's rescuing her more so um, than she's rescuing him. She's usually pretty damaged, um, fascinated by those who are, who are somewhat disturbed and, and you know have a long way to go to redemption. I find those those sorts of heroines fascinating. 
heroes, you know, I mean, as long as the underlying motivation is, is good, I think they can pretty much get away with most anything, but I think that's applicable to any anyone. But, uh, you know, for my heroes, typically, the mistakes that they made are because they're, they're very protective. That's a quality that I find especially attractive. So I write that into all of my heroes, and that protectiveness sometimes turns into obsessiveness, overprotectiveness. Um, that sort of thing. And th those things can walk a fine line between being attractive and being creepy. Yeah, being a stalker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So th with the sexual content, there, it, you talked about the porn, then erotic fiction, and then romantic fiction. Um, it, it's pretty heavy. Like, it's pretty heavy stuff in bed to, in bed to you. Is, was there a, a line? I mean, it was a strange moment in writing because your books came out around the same time that the Fifty Shades thing happened. And so uh, the, the general audience sort of had a, a, a sort of a growing acceptance of erotic fiction and what it could present to people. More people were reading it, more people were talking about it. So these books came out at a time that um, it, it maybe a year before and if it had the same sort of success it might have shocked a few more people but because there was more people talking about it. I mean, our accountant came to me and said, have you heard of this thing Fifty Shades? When that happened I knew that if accountants are reading erotic fiction, <laughs> then, then you're onto something. Yeah. yeah. Are there are there way, places you won't go in, in in the erotic writing side of things? I uh, well, I mean, uh, when people ask me to to talk about the level of eroticism in my novels, um, I describe it very simply as I write about one man, one woman using the equipment that God gave them. So, um, you know, I don't write BDSM. Uh, I don't use any sorts of you know toys or you know it's vanilla. It's very vanilla. Um, and and all of my books are like that. So some people ask me, well, how do you write about missionary sex over the course of 40 novels in 11 years and not get bored with it or, or have it be repetitious? Well, because it's not about the actual physical act. What we're writing about in that scene, of course, is this emotional connection between these two people. And who they are at the start of the scene is very different from who they are at the end because some epiphany has been reached during that scene or something was communicated that they weren't able to share verbally. That's why it never gets old. Uh, that's why it doesn't read the same no matter what because, of course, each character is coming into to it with different baggage. So how the outcome is is going to be different for each couple and, and each scene. It, that's you know that that's my writing style and so you know there's a lot of people who were you know a little bit surprised at the beginning because they were like oh I thought all erotic fiction either had menage you know you have multiple people in there or somebody's tying up somebody somebody's dominant somebody's sub submissive somebody's getting hurt somebody's not um, didn't know that you could write erotic fiction it's vanilla well, of course you can you know it's it's just uh, it's slightly more graphic but uh, you know the the core of the scene is that progression of the romance and the character arc well most people have vanilla sex you know, in, their, in their lives it's not the majority of people and they do it again and again and again but it's the same yes <laughs> it's, yeah it's like we're watching the, the u.s open tennis I mean, it's just tennis but because of all the emotion involved and the, and the different circumstances that come to this one court you're suddenly you're riveted. You know? Yeah, that's a very good way to put it. Yes, yeah. otherwise you'd watch one football game and you'd be oh, done. I've, well, I've seen, seen it. Seen it. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. right. Yeah. Sylvia, so, yeah, thank you very much for joining Booktopia. It's been lovely, thank you. All of Sylvia's books are available at booktopia.com.au right now.